I share with you a contemporary reading from Two Bubbas in a Bible by Reverend Dr. Delmar Chilton. We're called to be prepared, to be ready, to be open to the Spirit. And the only way to do that is to take seriously our call to study Scripture and to pray and to seek God's will in the community of the faithful. It was not by accident that it was Jesus' custom to go to the synagogue. He didn't go there because they were friendly, and this bunch certainly was not. He didn't go there because his family, his mama and his brothers and cousins went there, though they were. Jesus went to pray, to hear God's word read and explained, to prepare for the moment when God would call upon him to do something extraordinary. And when that moment came, he was ready. This morning, the gospel reading is from Luke 4, 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread all the, uh, through all the surrounding county. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I really would uh, almost rename my sermon, Listen, but both titles would work. Many of us have had the word of God used to hurt us. Amen. We have had words of God shouted at us. Yeah not proclaimed in loving inclusion, but preached down at us, thrown at us, used as a weapon rather than the voice of God. I found myself telling Shelley a story that had happened to me, which I don't think about very often, but this week I found myself telling the story because I was having my annual, having, having a pap smear. <laughs> so, sorry guys, but you know, these are things that are part of life. <laughs> But there was a time many years ago that I went to have a pap smear. And this doctor, while I was laying on the table, feet up in stirrups, mid-exam, asked me if I was sexually active. Instead of asking earlier. Knowing it was important to tell your doctor the truth so they could provide appropriate care for you, I told the doctor that I was a lesbian. While on the table, speculum in place, I was told what a sinner I was, and scripture was read at me. Do you think the word of God changed me in that moment? Yeah. <laughs> the word of God did not. But the proclaimer changed me, and I had no desire to have a pasmere again for a long time. <laughs> It made me cautious. We all have stories of how the word has hurt us in the past. And what has happened with that is it causes many of us to not approach the word and let it speak to us fresh today. Amen. And because we maybe didn't understand it in the past, we say, it's just confusing, I don't understand the Bible, so no, I'm not going to a Bible study because it's all over my head. And we don't come today to the word and listen for God to speak to us today. So today I say to you, listen. Listen to the word of God. Listen for the word of God. Slow down and listen for what God has to say to you. Not your neighbor, not somebody else, but you. Be conscious of what you bring to the word. What do you assume it says? Are you projecting or are you truly listening to the word? Are you listening for a new, fresh word, a fresh understanding? Jesus said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So listen 
Listen for the word because today, this day, not a historical day when Jesus said it, but this day, the word is being fulfilled in your presence. The word of God is sown into our hearts, into you and I, and it begins to change us right now, even when we may not fully know it or perceive it. The Holy Spirit is about doing a good work in you right now. Is there an amen? amen? The word was made flesh in Jesus. And once again, the word becomes flesh in you and I. It comes to life. Jesus said, these things have been fulfilled. Perfect tense in your hearing. They're here. Now, fait accompli. It's done. You know, those first century post-resurrection believers who heard the gospel of Luke proclaimed, knew that indeed Jesus brought good news to the poor, proclaimed release to the captive and brought sight to the blind. They'd seen it. He had let the oppressed go free and he promised the year of God's favor. They had seen it. They knew it. They had witnesses to it. Was every blind person given their sight? No. Was every poor person present to hear and receive the good news of their liberty? Work with me. No. <laughs> Here's the deal. The work was done and is done and is being done in Jesus. We're called the body of Christ, right? Amen. We who call ourselves Christians are supposed to be like him, to follow his example. His proclamation becomes our own. Are you with me? Yes. The good news is meant to be proclaimed through us. The healing of our broken and diseased world, the restoration of equality, the righting of injustice was done in Jesus and is done in and through us. It begins in us individually and it extends out from us. It's the Spirit of God at work in us. It is an ongoing activity of God in the world. So let's explore it a little bit more. We often say that this word of God, the, the scriptures are good news. But in order for you and I to receive it as good news, to hear it that way, it must at some level strike us first as bad news. That's why a lot of people don't like to listen to the Bible or go to a Bible study or go to church because it like, feels like bad news. But here's the deal. It's the bad news that we are not who we want to be. It's the bad news that... We're not who we can be, or we're not who we could and should be. And Jesus comes bringing that news, that awareness, and also good news to those in need and those who don't see and can't admit their need. They, they don't want anything to do with Jesus because we don't want to be confronted with our shortcomings. So we experience it first as bad news and can't see how it's good news. But when we can admit our need, when we can be honest with ourselves first, when we can acknowledge our deep hurts, our fears and longings, then stuff happens. It's just like the 12 steps. <laughs> first, I have to admit that I'm powerless. This is a similar thing. I have to first admit that I have need. Mm -hmm. Amen. That I can't change it just by myself. But when I can admit my need, my deep hurts, my failures, changes happen. First of all, we feel an immense freedom simply from admitting the truth to ourselves. True or true? true. <laughs> Bad news, when it's true, is still better than a good lie. Amen. <laughs> In other words, honesty is still better than the lie. Things haven't changed yet, but I've gotten honest. Second, having gotten honest, I'm now ready to receive the help and comfort that God offers. If I'm still in denial and in my lie, I can't receive the good news God's offering. Amen. But having been honest, then I'm ready to receive what God offers. Release, sight, healing, freedom, and so much more. Then third, we realize that we don't simply receive help and comfort and it's for ourselves, but we are invited to offer it yet again to others. We're invited, that is, not just to hear and receive, but to be it. Good news is not just something we get. Good news is something we live. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there an amen? Yeah. amen? 
Amen means like so be it, agreed, let it be done. Let it be a fait accompli in me. Let this work be accomplished both in me and through me. So listen for the word. Let it impact you. Let it change you. Let it be at work in you. Let it speak through you. Be eager to hear the word of God, the word of life that can change you. Now, in the Old Testament story from Nehemiah, we learn that the people themselves, rather than the priests or Ezra or Nehemiah, asked for the public reading of the Torah, the word. All the people, were told, were there, and they were eager and hungry to hear the word. Women, men, and children were present. An interpretation was given to help them understand the word. Now, the story doesn't tell us specifically what parts of the Torah Ezra read. And we don't even know if, if we knew that information, whether it would be in the same form as we understand it today and know it today. But more important than those specifics, like not getting lost in the logistics that can happen in a worship service, much more important is perhaps the practice that Ezra institutes of the authoritative reading of Scripture aloud in public and adding interpretations so all could understand. And hearing the Word of God moved the people. It revealed to them things about themselves and it revealed their hearts and their actions and it moved them. It evoked an emotional response and it led to a change in their lives. Now this public reading, this move could have been marked by dismay as it was for King Hosea when he first heard the words from the law book that was found in the temple because he ended up tearing his clothes and mourning and he recognized that the nation had neglected the divine commands of God and he was fearful of God's wrath. You can read that story in 2 Kings 22. But on this day, when the people began to weep as they heard the word and it moved on their heart and they began to weep for the ways in which they had perhaps failed God, when they were revealed before God, they began to weep. But Ezra and the other Levites that were with him began to tell the people not to weep but to rejoice instead because this day is holy to God. A day when we are revealed before God and revealed to ourselves is holy to God. That's good news to God, people. When we can make that movement, God's delighting that we're making that shift because now God can do the work in us that God wants to do. Amen. The walls come down. Amen? Amen? It's a day that's holy to God. And rather than fasting and mourning and weeping, they're told to feast. And also they begin the practice of giving to others because not only feast, but share their food with others who had not prepared. It's the beginning action. Because the joy of God is your strength. Now translations and commentators disagree over whether that's better translated, your joy in Yahweh is your strength. Your joy in Yahweh is your strength, or Yahweh's joy is your strength. Either way, it evokes the point of cheerful trust in God. Yes. Being entrusted with guidance from above, the word, inspires joyful gratitude. In other words, some of us fear that being condemned or being judged, that I'll stand revealed before God. You don't stay there. Here's the good news. You don't stay there. Amen? Amen. That really hearing the word moves you to joyful gratitude. Now Jesus, the local boy, <laughs> who has, we assume, been away for a while, comes back home to Nazareth. And does so, uh, no doubt, as he's done a dozen times before. He reads from the scroll of the Torah. Nobody disputes his right to read publicly. They are, however, shocked by his commentary, shocked by his claim that these words of Isaiah have been fulfilled by him. Who does this boy think he is? Well, this is one of the stories, one of the times in many ways that Jesus tells us who he is. He's one who proclaims good news. Restore sight, releases the oppressed, and proclaims the year of God's favor. The origin of the words that Jesus read is important too and deserves attention. 
because Jesus isn't just making up this stuff. He doesn't just show up at the synagogue and make some outrageous claim, even though it does seem outrageous. He is reading from the scroll of Isaiah, words that the people who are listening knew already. The outrage is that he says, this is me. And Jesus situates his ministry in the promise and prophecy of Isaiah and the ongoing promise of God to real people dealing with real challenges. Jesus' words, once again, are heard for us, I hope today, as a call to real life, real people dealing with real issues. This is God in our present, our present day and in our reality. Jesus used words they knew and brought them into an ordinary situation and breathed real life into those words. Once again, it's like the word becoming flesh right in front of them. Have you ever had the experience where words or concepts came alive for you? Have you ever had that? Something you knew, but you hadn't really seen it, and then all of a sudden that word or, or that teaching or that concept comes alive for you, it becomes very real. Maybe you've had an epiphany, aha, or bam. <laughs> the people who are laughing were in church a few weeks ago. <laughs> Now, right after the part we didn't read today, Jesus' friends and neighbors, some of the people who were at the synagogue that day, were not impressed at all by his claim. Indeed, they tried to run him out of town and tried to kill him, but he got away. And we were reminded that we cannot be distracted by worrying about what others will think of us. Hello? We cannot risk worrying about what others will think of us or how they might respond to us if we are truly followers of the way of Jesus. Our calling is to serve and to live prophetically, live prophetically as Jesus did. Our calling is to let the word change us, not just receive it, but receive it and give it back again. Amen. Who are you listening to? The world or the word? All too often, you and I act as though what happens in life is really up to us. <laughs> we act like we're in charge. We may say we believe God's in charge, but we act like we're in charge. True or true? true. We take a, a bow in God's direction, say a little prayer or two for guidance, but oftentimes we even tell God how to answer the prayer and what to do. And then we go about business relying on ourselves and our own ideas and our own interests and our own abilities. Amen. Yes? <laughs> We, too, forget that even Jesus depended on the Spirit. <laughs> Jesus prepared for his ministry with time alone with the Spirit, and he listened. So who are we to think we can act or go on our own, act as though we can go it alone? So as followers of Jesus, we are called to care, not just in our hearts, but also in our actions. We're called to caring actions all the time, not just on Sundays at 10 a.m., we're called to find ways as individuals and as community of faith, as communities, to do the very things that Jesus talked about and taught and modeled for us. To do any less would be to back away from our call to follow Christ, which means to follow his example. So I want to say again, listen to the word of God. Listen when you hear it in church, when you hear it in a Bible study, when you read it in your own devotionals. Slow yourself down and read it aloud and listen. Let it penetrate your heart, your mind, your body, your entire being. Let it convict you of what is right and what is wrong. Let it reveal to you what is going on inside of you honestly. Let it show the places where you're lying to yourself so that you can be open to another option. So you can stand before God and receive God. Let the word heal and restore and free you. Let it transform you so that you can live the word. Not watch it as an observer, but live the word. And then let the word be proclaimed through your living. We can love, care, and act in Jesus' name. So listen. What is your life saying? Listen. What is God saying? No need to weep or mourn about what you have and have not done. The past is the past. 
Amen? We used to do an exercise in the National Coalition Building Institute. We were trying to change our attitudes on lots of things. And we would say, a long, long time ago. And you sort of back up and be doing this. So and so said this or whatever that hurt my feelings. And, blah, 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 and you tell your story. Okay? And then we would actually do this action of taking a giant step forward and say, and now, today, I choose and we take a different action. The past is the past. It's part of our past. But today, we can act differently. I can hear the word differently than it was shouted at me. Can you hear the word differently than how it was used as a weapon? Can you hear the word of God cut through all that history and speak to you fresh today? Because it's time to feast. It's time to celebrate that you are hearing and receiving the transforming word, the word being made flesh in you, and that the scriptures are being fulfilled today in you, that you are discovering and coming to deeply know that being entrusted with God's guidance from above does nothing less than inspire joyful gratitude. So church, Keep listening and keep proclaiming. Amen.